to seminary and you often are taught that if you go visit a church, you pick a, you pick a, a, an easy text and you talk on something that is not controversial. And so that's what I decided to do tonight, talking about something that's not controversial. And I'm serious about that. I want to talk about something that should not be a, con a controversy at all. And that's the idea that God made humanity male and female. Uh, I know that you live in the Blessed Republic of Florida, so you might not have to face some of the things that uh, uh, some of us who live in lesser states have to, um, to face, but this is a serious thing that's going on in our culture. It's interesting that it is somewhat particular to the United States, uh, at least the, the feverish way that this transgender debate is gone. Most of the world had its time with it and figured out, nah, move on to the next thing, but it's lingering in the United States longer than in other parts of the world. And if you think about it, the transgender debate is really a debate about the nature of humanity. It's a debate about, to use a technical word, it's a debate about anthropology. Who or what is man, mankind, humanity, in general. Now you might ask, man, it's Sunday night, it's been a long day, the kids are restless, they want to go home, why spend time talking about this? Well, let me offer five reasons why this is important for us to be talking about, even on a Sunday night uh, at, the, at the end of a, of a long day. I don't know if you have noticed, but transgenderism is being pushed hard by the mainstream media, and by liberal political agenda. You can't turn anywhere without seeing some sort of praise for the transgender movement. Uh, that's part of every uh, political candidate agenda, either to speak against or for it. Uh, there's, there's been only one team in Major League Baseball that has not had a pride night this month and was not the Phillies. The, the Texas Rangers is the only team in the entire Major League Baseball that did not have a pride event this month. So it's being pushed upon us. You cannot get away from it. Even if you live in Florida, you cannot get away from this debate. Secondly, acceptance of the transgender, ide of transgender ideology has become the litmus test to determine whether you have a place in society. It, it, society decided that if you are against this, you cannot serve in society. You're going to be canceled. You don't, you, you don't have a voice. You can't speak to it. Uh, if, you look, if you read the book of Romans, start in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 18, and start reading to the end, many scholars think that what Paul is describing there is a downward spiral of sin. The more humanity sins, the more they're given up to their reprobate mind, and it goes down and down and down. As a side note, in the lower, more heinous level of sin is disobedient to parents. Perhaps more than what we want to think. But at the bottom, like the, the, the lowest level of hell, as it were, is the idea that we are to encourage and clap for people who in the practicing of their sin. And yet, if we don't do that in our society, you are going to be canceled. That's, that's where we are today. Thirdly, there's a lot of confusion about it, even in the Church of Jesus Christ. There are churches saying that they, we should all be you know, more inclusive, that we should be uh, affirming churches. Other churches uh, have no place for the grace of God in the life of a sinner. So we have these things that are confusing, and so we need to talk about, about this issue. Fourthly, the church needs to be proactive about this. We tend to be reactive. We, we, we get in our little Christian ghettos and in our bunkers, and only if things affect us, we're going to react to it. But this is something that we need to be proactive about. For example, there's camp this week. Have you started thinking about when a kid who claims to be transgender comes to camp? That's not if, it's when, okay? So we need to be proactively thinking about how we minister, not how we avoid it, but how we minister to 
people that are struggling in that area. Firstly, connected to this fourth reason, is that there might be people even in the Church of Jesus Christ, there, there are people even in the Church of Jesus Christ, who struggle with the feeling that they were born in the wrong, in the wrong body. It's not foreign to the church. Uh, you, may have heard of, you may have heard the name of uh, Robert Murray McShane. He was a Scottish pastor in Dundee, Scotland. And a lot of times, reading these old, guy, the old uh, people from the past, these pastors from the past memoirs, it is depressing for me because they seem to have accomplished so much in such a short a time. At the time. Uh, McShane died at age 29 of tuberculosis that he caught while serving as a missionary in Jerusalem, in Palestine. A lot of what we know about McShane is how the way that he corresponded with his congregation. He would write letters back and forth. And he got a letter from a woman in the congregation saying, Pastor, I wish I was as sanctified as you are, that I didn't struggle with sin like you. And he writes back to her and says, The seed of every sin dwells in my heart. We, even as Christians, are capable of every sin known to men. The seed of sin dwells in our heart. And the moment where, that we say there's no way that, that we're not going to struggle with it, that's the moment that we're in danger. Because we're saying, you know what, I don't need the grace of God in that area because I'm not going to struggle with it. And the reality is there are people in the church, true believers in Jesus Christ, who may struggle in this area, and that we need to know how to minister to them as well. But I do want to start by saying that the transgender position is an impossible position. It is unsustainable and equivalent to the tale of the emperor who had no clothes. Have you ever heard of that tale? Uh, that uh, he wanted some very fancy garment. This con artist of a tailor said, oh, I'll prepare this material with very rare fabric, and uh, it's going to be so special, and the guy pretends he's doing whatever, then the, the emperor pretends to put it on, and yet nobody has the courage to tell the emperor that he has no clothes. That's exactly where we are in this transgender uh, debate, that uh, most of our most people see that this is not sustainable and it's not realistic, but because there's such a push to accept it, nobody of consequence is willing to say, ah, he doesn't have any clothes on. That's where we are in this debate. Common sense tells us that the type of thinking that allows for the justification of transgenderism does not work for any other area of life. Just common sense. You can uh, look for it on YouTube, uh, Joseph Backholm, B, like back, B-A-C-K-H-O-L-M, years ago did a, uh, a documentary, a little video that he went to the Seattle campus of the University of Washington and he interviewed students. And it was right when the controversy, I don't know if it ever came here, but uh, where uh, stores were saying or clubs were saying that you could use whatever bathrooms you felt like on that day. So he went to the campus and started interviewing students and said, what do you think of that? Oh yeah, whatever people want to do, they should be able to decide. And Joseph, I, I know him personally, he's this tall, blonde, blue-eyed. Okay? So he, so he carries on, he kind of feeds the students so that they can get all excited. Oh yeah. And then he says, oh, wait, so if I decide that I am a six foot five Chinese woman, that's okay. And they look at him, you can see the gears kind of turning the student's mind. But by that point, they couldn't go back on the argument. But they see the absurdity, because common sense shows itself that this is an absurd statement. But not only common sense, scientific evidence shows that there's no such thing as a, as a transgender person, as, we, as transgenderism is decided. But our society doesn't care about science. We like to say science says, as if science is this one person over here that says things. But scientific community agrees that there's no such thing as a transgender uh, ideology. Uh, the, uh, the director of John Hopkins Medical School was also the uh, president of the American Psychiatric Association. And he said that to 
to deal with a person who has gender dysphoria, that's the idea that you think you're born on the wrong body, through surgery and body alteration is child abuse. And it doesn't accomplish anything. So that's the highest authority in psychiatric diagnosis in the country. The head of Johns Hopkins Medical School. As a result of making that statement, he was fired. So science, the scientific community says this is not something that we should be following, but our society doesn't want to follow. But the ultimate reason why you and I do not support transgender ideology is that the scriptures, the inspired, inerrant word of God, tell us that God's design for humanity is much more glorious than what transgender ideology has to offer. And brothers and sisters, unless we're convinced of that, we're going to lose the transgender de debate. The church in the United States is going to lose the transgender debate. If you're not convinced of what God has to offer us concerning gender ideology in the Bible, if we're not convinced that's more glorious and better than anything the world can offer us, we might as well just pack our bags and go home because we don't have a leg to stand in this argument. In the Bible, God teaches that humanity, mankind, is the crown jewel of God's creation. So God created everything in five and a half days. Most things in five and a half days. Remember that, right? The story, uh, the, not the story, but the account, the historical account of creation. Day one, he created light. In day two, he created clouds and oceans. In day three, he created land, fruit trees, and grass. In day four, he created the stars, sun, and moon. In day five, he created sea creatures and birds. In the first, day of, in the first part of the sixth day, he created land animals. And you remember how the cadence of Genesis 1 goes? It was... God spoke, things happened, it was evening and morning, and it was good. Day two, God spoke, things happened, evening and morning, it was good. Day three, you got the picture. What happened in day six? There's a change there. God speaks to himself. He doesn't just speak things in existence, he, speaks, he explains why he's doing something. He creates humanity, and then the cadence changes, because things are not just good. As verse 31 says, things are very good. And the idea of being very good is the idea of being complete. Creation was not average. Creation was not purposeless. Creation wasn't a good start that needed to be improved on. God's action of creation was successful in every part, and it was intentional in every part. God was purposeful in creating humanity the way he did, male and female in his image, the, the, with the ability to relate to him, not just as creature to creator or servant to master, but as children to a father, possessing an, an eternal soul that was going to either stay forever with him or forever rot in hell, with the ability to know God and be known by God that's how God created humanity. And no one, not the state, not any philosophical school, not any social movement can give humanity more dignity and more worth than God does. Our value and our worth do not come from ourselves. They are God-given. And if we don't believe that, we don't have a leg to stand in facing the transgender debate. And we have to remember that God created men and women, body and soul. As the Church of Jesus Christ, we're really into the soul, and we want souls to come to know Jesus Christ. But we we're created to exist forever as body and soul. We often tend to think of heaven as a place where when people die to, right now, if somebody were to die right now, they, if you're a believer, go to heaven. But you know that the Bible rarely speaks of that place as heaven? It is a good place. It is a great place. You're in the presence of Christ. But the word heaven in the Bible is reserved for that state in which you're going to be with Christ physically forever following the resurrection of the righteous. 
Eternity is a physical existence because our bodies matter. We're made to worship God, body and soul. We are looking for our blessed hope is that day in which we're going to see Jesus as he is, for we shall be like him. So God cares about our body. He made our body and our souls, and he has eternal plans for our bodies and our souls together. So that means that our bodies matter. We are living, emotional, and bodied beings designed to relate and reflect God with each and every part of ourselves, including our bodies. So what we do to our bodies matter to God. God is interested in the body, not just the soul. Why is this important? Pastor Brennan, are we allowed to talk to people? Of course. Okay, just wondering. Just I don't know. Some people might get scared if the pastor talks to them uh, directly. But why is it important to realize that we're body and soul as we think about the transgender debate? You don't have to say a lot, but think for a couple of seconds about why is it so important that we emphasize that both body and soul are important to God and we're made as a unit, a unity of body and soul. The main reason is this, one of the main arguments in the transgender movement is that I am not my body. I am not my body. I was born, in the, I was born as a different person than my body. I know my, I have a body of a man, but I was born as a woman, but my head. The Bible doesn't teach that. We're a unit made of body and soul that are united together in purpose and design. You notice that uh, God created the universe with a particular design. And we as creatures can't change that. You know, I'm th I think Mr. Sudi used to be a mechanic, right? You work in cars and you put a car together. Do you ever had a car tell back, t talk back to you and say, no, you can't put that part there? I'm assuming not. I hope not. Because then we'd have to talk to you later. Exactly, yes. But that's the, where we are. We are designed by God. We don't get to tell God, you know what? What you designed is not good. I'm going to change that. The sexuality debate in all its forms is a debate between competing authorities, ourselves and God, creatures and the Creator. And look around. If anybody's sleeping around you, walk them up, wake them up because this is the one thing you need to listen. The most important thing you're going to listen to in this sermon is this. Two things, very simple, they're ready to write down. In this debate, we have to be sure that we know two things. The first one is, God is God. Do you want to guess what the second one is? And we are not. God is God, and we are not. God got to create things the way He wanted. We are not God, therefore we don't get to create things the way we want. We get to submit to the way that God created things. Being creatures means that our highest calling and the greatest pleasure is found in living in line with how God has designed us. Are you convinced that God is good? Are you convinced that He's perfect? So a good God, who is also perfect, designed things perfectly. To change that is to change from the perfect to the imperfect. Being creatures means that we cannot recreate ourselves in any fashion or form that we desire by a simple act or the complex work of a surgeon. And when we as creatures reject the Creator's blueprint, when we reject what, how God has created us, we are both rebelling against the, na the natural order of, that God created, but we're also rejecting the life that is going to be the highest good for us. Even though at times this life of obedience doesn't feel like the highest good because sin messes things up. I was listening to, so, the, so Lakeland didn't get this part, so you guys are going to get an extra bonus here. I was listening to a podcast on the way over here, um, and uh, Rosaria Butterfield was being interviewed um, 
in the celebration of, May, of uh, Christian liberalism's 100th anniversary. And one of the things he said in Hebrews 10, in Hebrews 11, towards the end, it says that all these live by faith, and some had their children risen from the dead, they conquered armies, and some were beheaded and sawn in two. And the ones who conquered army were not any more successful than the ones who were sawn in half. They all did that by faith for the glory of Christ. Sin messes things up and might be difficult for us to do things, but whether we suffer or whether we had great victory is all for the glory of God if we follow what He has called us to follow and we are what He calls us to be. And our, the scriptures clearly teach us that humanity, mankind is composed of two and only two fixed genders. Very complicated thing, okay? Humanity exists as male and female. That's why they pay me the big bucks at the seminary, to say complicated things like this. Because that's how God made it. Not thirds, not eighths. As a matter of fact, according, um, according to um, sexualdiversity.org, there are 107 gender identities. Well, the scriptures teach us there are two. And the Bible tells us what a man is and what a woman is. Contrary to what some of our Supreme Court, Court justices say, you don't even need a biology degree to figure out what a man is and what a woman is. The Bible clearly teaches us, tells us what that is. Genesis tells us that a man is a human who can be united to a woman his wife, with whom he can physically become one flesh. That's what a man is. A woman is a person who can physically unite to her husband and become one flesh. The Bible teaches us that a person with a male anatomy is a man, and that a person with a female anatomy is a woman. It's kind of simple, uh, and that's the beauty of it. Anatomy shows that there is maleness or femaleness. Men and women are more than anatomy, but they're not less than anatomy. And to misunderstand, to blur, or to reject the Creator's categories for humanity doesn't just put us in rebellion against the Creator, it put us at odds with how each of us are made. And there's no good that comes out of it. And I want you to notice that a rejection of what Genesis wanted to teach is also a rejection of what Jesus teach. Because our Savior in Matthew 19 said this, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man set, separate. Here's what Jesus is saying. We are created people. We are created male or female. A man is someone who is, a, who is able to become one flesh, that is, have full sexual relations with a woman. And a woman is someone who is able to become one flesh with a man. And what God has done, people should not seek to undo, our Savior says. So we can only ignore Genesis 1 and 2 if we're also, as the Church of Jesus Christ, are willing to ignore the teaching of our Savior Himself. And I hope you see that that's not a, you see that that's not a good thing to do. Why do you think the Church has not had a bigger voice in this issue? I have a theory that I'll share with you in a second, but I want you to think of why do you think the Church has not had more of a voice in the issue, at least why the church's voice has not been heard as much. Pastor Brennan, can I actually ask for here? For? Sure. Yeah. Any ideas? Why do you think the church has not had much more, more of a voice in this issue? Mr. Hansen. Lawful repercussions. Lawful repercussions, okay. It's a fear, of the man, a fear of men, as it were, right? Oh, we might get sued. What else? 
John? Because we think it doesn't really affect us in the church. Does it, okay, that we don't think it affects us in the church. What else you guys might think? So that's a sign they need to think about this more. If you don't have an opinion on this matter. Let me propose to you that one of the reasons why the church has not been heard on this is that the church as a whole has not been very faithful in the view of the right view and the dignity of male and female. The church has either gone to one side where everything's the same and men and women have no differences and everybody can do all the same things and there's no difference there. To, and to another side over here, where yes, we believe there are differences and we're going to really be, uh, be overbearing over our women and we're going to abuse them and so on. And all these stories of abuse that have been happening in the church that denies the dignity of both male and female has caused the world to say, eh, there's no point in listening to those people. We need to find some other answer over here. And if we want to be heard on this issue as the Church of Jesus Christ, we need to be firm on this, that God created men and women different to complement each other, but equal in dignity and worth. How many of us have thought, she's just a housewife? She's just a mom. What we're doing when we do that? We're lowering the dignity and the worth of that office, of that role, right? The male role is not more dignified than the female role. They're different, and they're supposed to be different things, and our differences go all the way down to the DNA level, right? The DNA of a man is different than the DNA of a woman, and yet they both have equal glory in the sight of God. And we have to remember that as a church of Jesus Christ. And not, that, if we remember that, then abuse of authorities and things like that will be out the window. How do we get in this mess, into this mess? So what are the two common answers that works for most everything in Sunday school? Jesus is one, and the other one is sin. Yeah, the fall got us into this mess. Remember the story of the fall? In Genesis chapter 3? And I say the, the, I use the word story, but I mean the historical account of what actually happened with Eve and Adam. So Satan comes, and very subtly, he doesn't oppose God directly. He, he puts a doubt concerning God's word in Eve's mind. Has God really said? He really just wants to keep what's good from you. And Eve goes, hmm. Yeah, now that you mention that, that fruit looks good. Man, it's pleasing to the eye. It looks super tasty. Yeah, maybe God is trying to keep something good from me. And then she reaches out and takes the fruit. And her husband, which seems to have been standing right there, shares with her willingly. And by doing that, they decide that God's rule over them is not important anymore. They're going to strike out on their own. What are the first two things that they did after the fall? As soon as they realized, uh-oh, they did two things. They hid from God, hid from God and were ashamed of their body, body issues. The, one of the first things that happened out of the fall is that from that moment on, humanity now is uncomfortable with their bodies, <laughs> which is a change from Genesis 2.25, which tells us that they were both naked and unashamed before each other. All of a sudden, now I'm concerned about my body. And you can see that, that the beginnings, as it were, because of the fall of all these issues that concern the human body there. And their story, their struggle, is our struggle as well. We see that in our own lives. So, what do we do about it? What's the best way to address this transgender issue? Is the best solution for these feelings for men and women to modify their bodies? Is that how we're going to address that? 
Oh, you feel like a girl? Okay, let's get a surgeon involved, and so on. That's what our culture says. We're supposed to applaud that. But I hope you see that that's not a solution. It should even be a consideration. Do you know what anorexia is? So anorexia is, is a attitude in the part of a person. It used to be prevalent, more, uh, uh, occur mostly in young women, but now there's a high incidence in young men as well, in which uh, a, a young woman or a woman would uh, see herself as fat, regardless of the reality of her body. Uh, so you could have a six foot tall woman weighing 80 pounds and still thinking that she is fat. Look herself in the mirror and she's... Do we tell her, do we affirm her feelings? Oh, if you feel fat, then you should go ahead and go on a diet. If you think you're fat, then you should go ahead and go get liposuction. Is that how we counsel somebody with anorexia? No, because those feelings are inconsistent with the reality that she's living in. So when we say that somebody that feels like they're the opposite sex, go, go to the doctor and take care of it, that's the same sort of logic. Or, have you ever come across or have you ever heard of somebody who feels like their life's not worth living? That they feel like they would be better off just ending their lives? That's how they feel in their innermost being. How do we counsel them? Do we say, oh, if that's how you feel, go do it. No, that's not how we counsel them. And yet we've accepted this idea that if you feel like you're a man trapped in the body of a woman or vice versa, there's a solution for it is to give in into those feelings. That's not how we deal with it. Sin comes from the heart, and the heart needs to be addressed, not the body. We can change our bodies, we can change our form, but we cannot change our formatting apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the thing that's most frustrating, that we have the ultimate solution for this struggle. And it is the good news that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. And how do we know that? The Bible teaches it. But we also have experienced it. Do you know who the worst sinner you know is? Satan. Satan? Maybe. <laughs> do you know who the worst human sinner you know? <laughs> Qualify there. Yeah. It's not the transgender person out there. It's me. It's you. Do you know why? You know your heart. You don't know anybody's heart, else's heart, but you know your heart, and you know the darkness that's in there, and you know that Jesus Christ changed your heart by His Spirit, gave you a, a heart of flesh, is able to believe in Jesus Christ, and if He can save me, if He can save you, there's nobody else he can't save. There's nobody else he can't change. There's nobody else he can't minister to. There's no Christian out there that doesn't have the Holy Spirit that can't grow in the situation they are in. So what do we do with this? How do we speak into this? How do we help people who are struggling with this? The same way that we help somebody who's struggling with any sin. By applying the Word of God, the sufficient and powerful Word of God, to that situation. So don't buy into the lie that what God has said about who you are is not good. Now, God created you wonderfully, and He's good. So at the social level, at the public level, we must engage in the debate. We cannot be afraid of lawsuits. We can't take anything with us anyway at the end. Who cares if we lose our tax exemption? That's the only country in the world that gives Christians tax exemption. It, the church is this country. And Christianity exists all over the world. We need to speak. We need to be unashamed 
We need to be unapologetically, but we need to be kind. We need to be civilized as we do that. We need to engage in the public discourse. You need to, we need to get elected into school boards. We need to start making policies. We cannot retrieve to Christian ghettos and be satisfied with a bunker mentality because we're going to lose the battle in this country. Christ is going to be with the church, and nothing is going to prevail against it, not even the gates of hell. But the church will disappear from this country if we just stay in our pews and not engage in the public square. But on a personal level, we compassionately bring the light of the gospel into the discussion to demonstrate that one's true identity is not in their sexual desires, but in Jesus Christ. And to do that, we need to be convinced that our primary identifying factor is as a Christian. That's who we are. It's interesting that, um, you know, this might sound like, and I'm going to finish with this, this might sound like heresy to you, but it's not. I guarantee you, you can check. <laughs> the Bible does not call Christians sinners. There's one passage, you might do that, is in James chapter 4, but that's not how the Bible, the New Testament, addresses Christians. Christians are saints. Saints who sin, but Christians are never identified by their sin. You're not a sinner. You're a Christian. You're a saint who sometimes sin. And the way we think of ourselves is very important. So there's no such thing as a gay Christian or a drunkard Christian or a pedophile Christian. You have Christians who struggle, but our primary identity is in Jesus Christ. And that message is going to deliver people from this idea that they are bound by their feelings that are contrary to their bodies. And it's a message that we have and we can give to the world. Let us pray together. Mm -hmm.